right, folks. So hi. Hey there. Hey there, yes. Well, my name is Tiffany Taylor, and I have the pleasure of serving as a partner and chief people and impact officer at GSV Ventures. And I just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to have a Q&A with the renowned educator, author, and policy advisor, Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. So we're going to spend our time together in uh, two ways. First, we're going to hear a little bit about the latest works, insights, and reflections from Dr. Darling Hammond. And then we're going to spend the lion's share of our time taking questions from the audience. So if you have not already downloaded the app, be sure to download the app and add this session to your agenda. The live Q&A uh, function is live now, and you'll be able to start submitting questions as Dr. Darling Hammond is speaking. All right. Um, and with that, Dr. Darling Hammond, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Uh, and there's such great news coming from ACGSD these last uh, couple of days. And this morning, I'm going to look forward to how to transform public education in part by looking backward. Uh, and what how we've got the system that we have. I will argue that we need to change the system, not just individual schools or tweak around the edges. All of you know that the news from about public education these days has been often very grim. People are worrying about learning loss, chronic absenteeism, declining enrollments, massive teacher shortages. Uh, many public schools are struggling. Uh, and some wonder if the system can have recovered. That some are actually working aggressively to ensure that it doesn't. With private school vouchers, uh, fomenting culture wars, uh, we've seen this all over the country. But while there are many schools struggling to deal with the stresses of the pandemic and these other events, there are also many that are succeeding in engaging their students and meeting a wider range of needs than ever before. The schools that are having the most success uh, are those that have already redesigned. Uh, we see this in California, community schools uh, that have not only wraparound services, but uh, very personalized strategies for supporting students socially, emotionally, and relationally. We see it in late learning schools, which are college and career uh, uh, experiential learning, small high schools uh, that are working in and with the community uh, with students and in internships, as well as project based learning. Uh, when I recently spoke to this California Assembly about our post pandemic plans, I served here as the president of the California Board of Education, uh, I talked about some of these schools. I talked about elementary and high schools, about urban and rural schools that are succeeding, that uh, are seeing high attendance, enthusiasm, engagement from families and students, gains in achievement, uh, while others have been struggling. And in that testimony, uh, I talked about how we need to, as policymakers, move beyond the factory model constraints that uh, we have inherited. From 100 years ago, uh, when the um, you know current school system was created, and how it's important for us to avoid the straitjackets that put schools into the old boxes, the old designs over and over again, uh, invite the community into the school, engage students with the community, provide ambitious instruction, apply to real world problems, uh, using space, time, and technologies to their effect, supporting teachers with time for collaboration and sharing their expertise and supporting the kind of innovation that we need to meet today's new knowledge demands. Uh, I'm going to note that this is a moment in which we can do this work. We've experienced a public health crisis, an economic crisis, a climate crisis, a civil rights crisis. All of these have highlighted the inequalities in our society and in our education system. But it's at times like these in human history that we often can achieve generational social changes because of the disruption that we've experienced. Uh, I think we need to use this time to support systemic change at the Learning Policy Institute. Uh, we put out early on uh, a set of examples of how we can restart and reinvent school, and we just talk about reinvention because the schools that were designed, as I said, in the early 1900s were not designed to support relationships, a whole child approach, the kind of deeper learning 21st century skills that we want all children to acquire now, the personalized supports that we see are so needed in this time of trauma uh, and anxiety uh, or equitable opportunity or achievement. And I want to underscore that 
Educators are working hard to make the system work for these goals, but they're working against the tide. Mm. Um, schools we have to work on the fact that the assembly line, uh, the freshman age grading system was adopted. Uh, students are first case teachers are here, and then they're in high school every you know 50 minutes. The platoon system, every teacher was placed as an individual worker on the assembly line. Tracking was designed explicitly to create different conveyor belts for students by race and class. And I want to bring you some of the quotes from the people who helped design the schools that we are now trying to make work for very different purposes. First, it's important to understand that eugenicists were very much involved with the scientific managers of the early 1900s in helping to shape the new schools. I'm sad to say that it was Stanford University Education Dean Elwood Coverley, uh, who was one of these, uh, he noted in an early track that he uh, put out that Southern and Eastern Europeans were different from the Northern Europeans who preceded them, the literate, docile, lacking in self reliance and issue, and put out the idea that our city schools will still be forced to give up the exceedingly democratic idea that all are equal and to begin a specialization of educational effort. Uh, and that idea was picked up by many, many of the scientific managers designing the schools. Uh, they got to the point when they decided that schools should be explicitly designed to select and sort. Uh, W.E. Pillsbury was an administrator at the time who wrote in the administrative journals, and he put out the idea that was picked up by many that the school system should be a means for selecting the men of best intelligence from the deficient and mediocre. Uh, the incapable were intended to be rejected or dropped out and passed into the ranks of unskilled labor. The more intelligent and clerical workers and passed into the high school, only the most intelligent would go into the profession. The idea was not that the school would help people uh, you know, change uh, from their predetermined path, but that they would, in fact, encourage the dropping out, the selection, uh, the sort of Darwinian idea of the survival of the and then racism was built right into that design. Mm. So again, at Stanford, uh, Lewis Carroll was the IQ test developer who uh, began the process of modern testing in this country. And he was putting out uh, ideas like the following. Uh, he said that 80% of the immigrants he tested were found to be feeble-minded. And then he went on to say that Indians, Mexicans, and Negroes should be separated into special classes that cannot master abstractions. They can often be made for shell workers. All of this is kind of built into the warping look of the system that we're now trying to change. Charlie designed the IQ test to create the bell curve. Uh, the bell curve is artificially created by um, uh, throwing out questions to which too many or too few students know the answer, or to which the wrong subset of young people knows the answer. When he first invention, invented the IQ test, girls have to our boys, he knew there had to be something wrong with that. <laughs> on the top, there is still a practice going on in testing in this country right now that when, for example, black students do better on an item than white students, it is tossed out because it doesn't meet the norming uh, population. And the assumption is that if the people who are against whom the test is normed don't outperform others on a question, there's something wrong with the question. Mm -hmm. Scientific managers were designed schools to select and sort efficiently. Teachers work was designed uh, with dead creek classrooms and a stop on the assembly line to stamp the students with a scripted lesson. The teacher was explicitly and consciously feminized because they thought that women would be more obedient and work for lower wages. There's a whole literature about this in the history of the modern school in the early 1900s. And then as Max Weber, who was sort of the theorist of bureaucracy, put it, that bureaucracy is perfected to the extent that it is dehumanized. Mm. And we can see all the ways mm. in which making decisions based on rules rather than people uh, has not only uh, dehumanized schools, but often tried to standardize them when in the reality of human existence, we are you know, individuals who are highly variable. Now, in recent years, the growing science of the learning and development uh, that have been increasingly organized and synthesized and, and brought to bear on uh, at least on our consciousness 
principles and how our school systems have proved that the assumptions of this school model are basically false. That genes do not drive who we become, that in fact context is the primary driver of who we become, and that is based on the relationships and the experiences we have. And when those are positive relationships, strong positive relationships, and when the experiences are rich and experiential inquiry type experiences, learning takes place uh, and uh, is not a function of you know, whatever our brain composition was at birth because the brain is always developing. Even at my age, it is continuing to wire. The neurons that wire together, wire together, wire together, and the way we use our minds determines what our minds become. Talent is not scarce, it's actually plentiful, and it is not great on a bell curve on a single dimension on which we can rank order everyone and decide what they're then entitled to. Uh, we know that average does not stand for the individual. In fact, it very rarely does in everyone's brain and cultural background and individual proclivities are different. Uh, because of that, the factory model cannot be the way to educate children. The pacing guides and standardized practices we've inherited uh, basically expand inequality rather than reducing it. Uh, and we know that agency and engagement is what supports the deeper learning, and we also know that we cannot know the potential of an individual in advance and put them on their separate conveyor belts because potential is visible in environments that are designed to reveal it. Hey. And that is our yeah. job as educators, is to design those environments that will reveal potential and then to develop the potential uh, to the maximum levels. And that means that what we're really saying is that we want to change what school is actually for. Because our schools are designed for selecting and sorting different people with different opportunities. They're designed to allocate social roles and benefits. They're designed to provide training workers and services, but they're not designed yet. And we must design them to ensure access to knowledge, to create common brain, to develop the talent and potential, to provide empowering learning for everyone, and to create a more fair and equitable society. And I was sort of note that we've known how to do this for more than 30 years, and I want to share you a little snippet of the work that was going on. I was privileged to be involved with people who were designing new schools in New York City uh, back in the 1990s. Uh, and I want to show you one of those very quickly uh, and how we uh, have been able to develop a uh, very different reality. At the center of this story is the Julia Richmond Education no, it's I put this building up against any school in the Board of Education system by rows. This is the best place I have ever I kids love people. As a matter of fact, I have enough students who don't want to graduate because we have literally created a familiar environment. The story of Jay has been in this time. Okay, because what the public has come to understand about education is usually seen through the lens of failure. But we have a Jimmy Richmond as a successor.
when the teacher was frightened of, they just didn't have the relationship with the student that made for a reasonable uh, teaching experience, and they were scared of the kids they had in the school. Just when they walk in, we was paired up. Most of the time, it was two officers together, along with an NYPD cop. The place was bad. Okay, and no matter how many times we tried to do something new with them or put new leadership in it, uh, it just it needed a major systemic overhaul. And this was a really a overhaul that completely redefines what a school could be. That was a quick. Exceptions, but we've got to move the schooling system from those impersonal structures uh, that were perfected in the bureaucracy to relationships that are designed. We've got to move from transition teaching, in which I talk and you listen, to active inquiry based learning, which is much more effective. We've got to move from getting through the book to enacting you know, projects and experiences that really make a difference that students are motivated to engage in with and for their communities. We got to move from teach, test, and grade to a standards-based approach that supports and provides feedback and vision opportunities, which is how we develop mastery. Uh, we've got to move from those multiple choice tests that are used to rank, sort, and select to standards-based tasks that are used to identify, demonstrate, and develop greater ability. 
um, that moved from tracking and segregating to inclusive classrooms, from exclusionary punishments to restorative practices, and from schools as little islands to schools as hubs of family and community. And this requires some major policy shifts. Uh, it means that we need funding and accountability systems that support meaningful opportunities to learn and equitable opportunities to learn. It means that we need curriculum and assessment policies that enable and encourage deep experiential learning and mastery rather than uh, sorting. We need to focus on competencies, not seat time. You won't believe me about law and regulation that is tied up in having instructional minutes in a variety of ways. Uh, we've got to move from integrated student supports. Uh, we need to develop those integrated student supports. Uh, that we move off to the story, including tutoring, which we know can produce a dramatic acceleration in learning, uh, but doesn't even have a place in the factory model day unless we rethink it, unless we rethink the roles of staff, yeah. uh, and which we put in place multi tiered systems of support, uh, health and mental health care services in this country, where, uh, as Gloria Lassen Billings puts it, we've engaged in the aggressive neglect of our children who have the highest rates of poverty, homelessness, food insecurity of any in the industrialized world. Yeah. We've got to develop staffing systems that support teams, time for teacher collaboration, and the sharing of expertise that we need, high quality educator preparation for teachers, principals, everyone in the system that is freely available. We should say, if you will teach, we will pay for your education, and we will invest in you throughout mm -hmm. your career. And I'm just going to close with the words of this parent. Atlanta, um, who, as near the beginning of the pandemic, really, I think, set the agenda for us. She said, reprioritize. This is the time to see if something can be different, to reset the system we have to take a loss, so we can recoup the loss of the actions that kids excited about education mm -hmm. and create a more positive space for them to learn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Donnie Hammond, I know you can't necessarily see us, but I do want to let you know that the room is packed, and I'm sure with educators, philanthropists, uh, policymakers who really appreciated everything that you shared with us. And now I am going to jump into uh, the questions that they have been submitting. And so if you see me looking at my phone, that is what I'm focused on. If you haven't <laughs> downloaded the app, please do that. And we're gonna start, um, Dr. Dallin Hammond, with this question. We received a lot of questions regarding this tension between the necessary um, innovation and the accountability system. Can you share your thoughts regarding this tension and how we work to innovate given the accountability system we currently have? Well, we inherited an accountability system um, image from No Child Left Behind, which has been, you know, evolved a little bit in the Ever Students of Seeds Act, which was really about um, a theory of action that said, uh, you know, uh, set test score benchmarks and increase those every year uh, and punish the schools that don't meet their benchmarks every year. Mm -hmm. uh, that was happening by the way that when poverty was deepening, when the uh, the differential between the haves and the haves not have nots was getting greater, but we really focused in that era on testing rather than investing. Uh, there <laughs> has been more uh, effort to start to look at opportunities to learn because in fact doesn't do as much good to know whether test scores are going up or down if we don't know what's behind them. We don't know whether kids are getting equitable resources, whether they're getting well-prepared teachers, whether they're getting high-quality mm -hmm. curriculum, whether they're getting a positive, safe school climate in which they're being supported. So I think part of what our accountability system is beginning to do, certainly we've been working on this in California and other states have as well, is to look at things like climate, to look at things like um, college and career readiness and access to um, college preparatory and uh, career ready uh, experiences, internships, uh, civic engagement is about to, I hope, be part of our college and career ready index. Uh, to look at the things that are the opportunities that children have yeah. and to use those as a way to drive the investments that we need to make and the changes that we need to make. The Department of Education has invited this kind of rethinking of our accountability systems. 
uh, in a sort of commentary of that piece of guidance a year ago that invited states to come back and propose uh, additional indicators and accountability systems that would look at opportunities to learn, that would look at the ways in which we're supporting students uh, and what more needs to be done. So I think that's a big piece of it. Uh, the other piece of it is that we had test data as a big part of accountability systems, and our tests are sort of based on the 1950s multiple choice testing technology uh, that does not uh, give students encouragement and opportunity in most places to be engaged in meaningful uh, performance based work. So there's a whole additional agenda that needs to go on to move assessment to where it is in some other countries where. Project-based learning is part of the assessment system where students are getting curriculum equity because they need to be engaged in these kinds of investigations. Mm -hmm. We see this happening. The Advanced Placement Program is now bringing performance-based tests into the Advanced yeah. Placement um, courses. And they've done it in courses where they've seen that it has enhanced learning, it's enhanced equity, uh, and it's really better prepared students for what they will encounter in college. So, uh, the agenda is clear, we've got to get the will to enact it. Thank you. So the next question that we received is, the changes required to move a system require a huge mindset shift for most educators. How do you go about creating a sense of urgency amongst teachers with a more traditional mindset? Well, we all want to do what we know has worked for us, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're all learning from our experience, we're all enacting you know, what we do based on what we think will, will be successful. And changing means that quite often we will have to do things in ways that are um, scary, you know, that we're going to try new things. But also we've been doing it our whole school. It's not fair to teachers, it's not fair to school uh, staff to say, you know, uh, change this on your own without changing the features of the structure in which they live. Mm -hmm. uh, I came into teaching, um, as you know, Tiffany, yeah. in um, the Camden and Philly area. Yeah. I taught in big warehouse factory model high schools yeah. uh, where I didn't have anyone to play with in the team. I had no way to come to know my 180 students you know, deeply in love, as far as I tried, where there were no structures in the school to support the kind of practices that would have been more successful for them. So we have to change the structures in schools uh, in ways that I described, you know, teaching teams who share groups of students where we have more uh, longitudinal relationships, looping as well as uh, advisory systems, uh, where we have time for teacher collaboration, we have less collaboration time for teachers than any other country in the world, with the sometimes exception of Chile, which is tied with us in some of the yeah. talents data. But otherwise, you know, we have not structured schools to allow for yeah. new practices. And we know yeah. the more time teachers have for collaboration around these practices, the more likely they are to implement them, uh, the more they have that opportunity to work with their colleagues and to get coaching, the more likely those implementations are to be successful. So part of it is that we've got to understand the foundational changes that are needed to enable teachers to step further into a new uh, mode of practice that is appropriate. I love that. And just building on um, what we need to do to enable our teachers to, to, to shift their mindset, uh, we got a question. How do you see AI changing teacher training? Well, AI is going to change everything. <laughs> <laughs> and so part of what we have to figure out now, human beings are part of the intelligence and capacity of human beings with our ability to use tools. Mm -hmm. Because we think, oh, you know, using this tool or that tool will be cheating in some way mm -hmm. uh, when, when it comes to school, uh, or will you know change what uh, our our use of our own abilities. So I mean, AI is going to uh, make it possible for us to you know uh, develop uh, new approaches to simulations to uh, share. Um, you know, share what we know with each other in new ways to, of course, you know, score 
essays, you know, yeah. um, using AI to, you know, there's just so many ways to still make a difference. Uh, what we have to be thinking about is what, as human beings, uh, with our both caring capacities and intellectual capacities, uh, not to memorize information, which is like the old thing we keep trying to get you know, schools to be about, uh, but to critically think and weigh and balance and problem solve and use our values to um, move things forward, how do we bring that together with AI in ways that make a lot of pieces of the job more efficient yeah. uh, and more supported by uh, access to other people's performances and practices and ideas, uh, and then you know use what we can do to build you know teachers who are caring and have dispositions for thoughtfulness and for equity and who can see students and who they are and who they understand them, you know, who can assess what they know in more sophisticated ways, maybe using some of the AI, yeah. but then building on it to, to develop their capacity. So it's all about how it gets used yeah. um, for the purpose of humanizing yeah. schools, uh, humanizing preparation, making us capable of being better people yeah. who are able to you know, get us out of the mess that we're in the world with, you know, climate change and conflict as we're about to, you know, lose the human species in another few decades. If we are really thinking about how are we using the tools we have to prepare people who uh, are thinking about each other co collectively and moving the ball towards human development. I love that. And so just, just to continue on that, um, that, that train of thinking a bit, uh, the question we received, as we work to create inclusive, anti-racist, joyful learning spaces, this uh, educator or leader is wondering how might we measure our student engagement on a frequent basis in a healthy and formative way? I love that, right? I mean, on the one hand, there's just you know, look around and see, you know, the engagement and the enthusiasm and the equity that should be visible mm -hmm. in the way kids are getting access and the way in which they're, you know, engaging and the way they're experiencing belonging. But of course, you can use everything on the classroom level from exit tickets to how people are feeling to little surveys to, um, you know, climate uh, surveys that are used school-wide. At various points in time, so we can see how um, the, the uh, experiences of people are, are showing up. So, some of those I think should be happening a couple of times a year, and then we should be always you know, uh, thinking about what should we do to address the fact that this group of students or this um, you know, particular um, classroom or whatever is you know, not feeling that sense of engagement and a joy. In learning, um, so there's, there's that kind of data that we can use regularly. There are some folks who are using surveys like the PERT survey, which uh, teachers can use in their own classroom to get regular, real time feedback uh, all the time and then work with that with students as partners. You know, when you say to students, my goal is to be sure that you have these experiences, help me know when we're succeeding and when we need to uh, think differently. You know, that is a very big uh, tool for engagement in and of itself. Uh, uh, and I see that happening. Uh, and my goal is for the system as a whole to encourage, endorse, and support that so that it's not just folks, you know, blowing into the wind, so yeah. to speak. Understood. And so for the, the school leaders that are here with us today, what are school, I would say school and system leaders, what are three things that they can do tomorrow to help improve the learning environment in their schools? Well, every school is starting from a different place. Yep. So, you know, whatever's the next thing for you to do in your school will depend on how you think you or your school is sort of measuring up on, on different um Anyway, so one of the first things I think is just to piggyback on that last question, how do you make your school a joyful place? Mm -hmm. How does every part of school become a joyful place? Uh, and a place that is safe, mm -hmm. that is uh, where there is uh, no bullying, where there is no uh, stigma, where there's no stereotype threat. Uh, so 
so safe and joyful. I think our starting points, if you haven't yet got there, that's the, the place to begin. Yeah. I think that that requires explicit engagement with social and emotional learning and supports. People need to learn together ways to manage their talk, recognize their feelings, to manage those, to collaborate and, and interact in productive ways. This can be done at the high school level just as much as it can be done at the elementary school. Uh, I started a school from colleagues here at East Palo Alto, and we started out with a very, at that time, the, the community was known as the upper capital of the United States because of the number of drive-bys, a lot of gang activity, a lot of violence around kids, so they were not getting um, uh, the opportunity to learn conflict resolution strategies uh, necessarily at home. They meet every you know, morning in mindfulness. We have advisories twice a day in the morning so that you can touch base with kids and make sure they have breakfast and see who had experience from and make sure that everyone was supported. And then in the afternoon to see how kids were doing academically and to be sure that if they needed after school support that they would get that, etc. But in that process, those became the places for uh, learning mindfulness practices, learning social and emotional skills, learning conflict resolution, putting in place restorative practices. And within a few years, uh, you know, the kids were, uh, it was an extremely safe place, and the kids were protecting the environment and teaching those tools to others in their families. So you have to be very explicit about it. You can't assume that, uh, that everyone's going to come to school ready to appreciate everyone else <laughs> in the building. Uh, and, you know, not all this come from families. And I would say this is true for me, where that basket of skills was being exhibited. And so we need to learn it together, teachers and students and staff. And then around um, joy, we have to find out what, you know, is really exciting and motivating. And of course, when kids get to see how they work, whether it's math, science, or whatever, applies to what they care about, uh, they will, engaged in joyful way when they see that they'll have the opportunity to revise their work uh, rather than just getting a grade and then feeling, you know, like I can't do this, I've got to see my list or D or an F. But if there's always an opportunity for revised work yeah. with help to redo and then to be credited with the final result of the learning, not after you did, you know, the attempts along the way, and that produces a kind of joy because the student feels like they're capable. Yeah. Uh, of achievement. And so these kind of practices, um, you know, are the foundational elements. And every school will start in a different place. Many schools have pieces of, of these uh, components, or they may have it in some classrooms and not others. And the other thing that's very important is for teachers to work together to get shared practices. Because mm -hmm. it's extremely debilitating for kids to go from one classroom to another where they get a very different experience. You know, one teacher, you know, it cares about one thing, another teacher cares about another thing, and you're supposed to carry it all in your head for seven or eight teachers and try to please a different boss every 45 or 50 minutes. Um, you've got to get to a place where we have shared practices. Um, in the school I talked about, we had a rubric that was used for every assignment and every course and every grade, and it asked to, uh, for kids to be evaluated on critical thinking, knowledge, um, personal responsibility, social responsibility, and communication. Yeah. And so we got used to the fact that this is the way we do business and we do it around a revised and redemption notion. Uh, and these kids who came in at third and fourth grade reading and math ones uh, went on to college degrees and graduated rates of 90% and then college degrees of 90% uh, because they had that support system yeah. throughout the school. I love it. I love it. And we have 60 seconds left, and it went by fast. So we're going to end off on this question. In 60 seconds or less, Dr. Darling Hammond, as a lifelong learner, we would love to know what books you are reading right now. I wish I had time to read. <laughs> Yep. I love it. I, 
Yes. Well, Dr. Darley Hammond, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and most importantly, thanks so much for all that you are doing for students, educators, and communities around the world. We truly appreciate you. Um, and folks, thanks so much for joining us today.